Hello everyone and welcome back to Mesomedic, a channel that is only about medicine half the time. My name is Kitty and I'm an academic junior doctor working in the UK and this is the second video in the CV Building for Medical Students mini-series and today we'll be focusing on research, publications and presentations. Getting involved in medical research is something that a lot of medical students struggle with, often not knowing who to ask, where to start, or they're simply intimidated by the prospect of medical research. However, as most of you probably know, there's a huge importance placed on research in a medical CV. In this video, I'm going to be first talking about why research is important as a doctor and what opportunities are there in medical school to get involved. From there, I'll talk about the practical points of doing research from identifying a supervisor, what types of research projects you can get involved in, and finally producing research output. Lastly, I will also talk a bit about academia in medicine if you decide that research is something that you want to do in the long term. So firstly, I want to talk about why research is important. I feel like a lot of medical students and trainees put a lot of focus on doing research as part of a tick box exercise. And to be fair, I get it. Uh, presentations and publications are what scores you points on specialty applications, so naturally everyone puts a lot of importance on the output and the numbers game as it were. However, there are actually many benefits to getting involved in medical academia, even if you don't want to be a researcher in the end. 1. It's a great way to learn a bit more about your specialty of choice. 2. It keeps you up to date with the research and innovations that are going on in the medical field. 3. It's a good opportunity to network and work with other trainees with similar interests. And finally, you will learn what is good research and critically appraise academic papers. This is a very important skill as a doctor practicing evidence-based medicine. My opinion is that if you do a research project that you're interested in, supported by a good supervisor, then the output with publications and presentations will naturally follow. So what opportunities are there to do research during medical school? Number one, intercalated degrees. Doing an intercalated degree such as a BSc, MSc or a Masters in Research or MRes is probably what comes to mind first when people think about doing research as a medical student. Having not intercalated myself, I'm probably not the best person to give advice on this, but in future videos I will be inviting some of my friends who have done these intercalated degrees to give you their thoughts and what they've gotten out of their year. But essentially, intercalated degrees are a great way to one, spend a year away from medical school, to pursue any particular interest that you might have, and three, to buy yourself a year's time to get some academic achievements underway. Intercalated degrees also come with the advantages of having a dedicated supervisor to oversee your work, a research department associated with a university, and formal teaching on research methodology, which can be invaluable. Secondly, SSCs, or Student Selected Components or Modules. These are usually built into the medical school curriculum and refer to a period of time, usually about a month, where the student can choose to pursue a project of their own. This is a great time to reach out to supervisors that are available to you and try and get some research underway that you can continue in the long term. Thirdly, there are many summer research internships available to medical students in the UK. For example, at Bristol there is something called the INSPIRE initiative which offers monetary grants for students who write good research proposals and follow them through. Nationally, there are also many other research grants that are offered by various societies such as the Wellcome Trust and you'll always find something floating around if you look for them. There's nothing like getting some bonus cash whilst you're enriching your CV at the same time and they also count as an award. And lastly, of course you can do some research alongside the medical school curriculum whenever you want to. Medical school as we all know is busy, but actually it is very possible to get involved in research if you manage your time well. The key to this is developing good prioritisation and organisational skills. Finding a balance between research, medical school and your social life can be very difficult but not impossible. Try to delegate a few hours of protected time every week for your research project. Remember to always put your medical school assessments and exams first, and remember to fit in some time for your personal well-being. Now let's talk about the practical side of getting some research done. Your first step should be trying to find a good supervisor for your project. As a medical student, even if you have a good idea of what specialty you want to go into, it is still incredibly hard to start and finish a research project by yourself. This is because you generally don't know as much about the trending research topics in the specialty, and you also don't know what fits into the department's interests. A senior academic supervisor is the answer to these problems. They're the ones who know what's going on in the specialist research field, the department interests, their patient population, and crucially, they're the ones who can give you explicit advice on where to publish and where to present your work. Oftentimes, medical journals even require you to have a consultant supervisor down as an author as a way of vouching for the accuracy and integrity of your report. 
So how do you go picking a supervisor? Essentially, you're looking for someone senior, preferably a consultant or a professor in your specialist field, who already has a good academic track record by way of research output. There are multiple ways of identifying a knowledgeable and supportive senior supervisor. You can make contact with the university if you remember a certain lecturer who is very good. You could ask someone in clinic. You can ask a clinical fellow in your trust about any consultants that they know that are good. Or you could harness the power of the internet like I did, look up the list of consultants working under the department in a certain hospital, and pick the one that looks the most friendly with a few publications under their belt. Now that you have identified your potential supervisors, it is time to get emailing. Say who you are, express your interest, and ask about opportunities to get involved. A lot of medical students seem to be intimidated by the prospect of contacting a senior clinician, but seriously, don't be. A lot of consultants actually have a lot of ideas about what research or audits they want to do, but they lack the time to actually do it themselves. Additionally, it always looks better when you're the one who's taken the initiative to contact them, rather than being assigned to them in an SSC that you didn't choose. And finally, and I say this to everyone, you have absolutely nothing to lose by emailing them. The worst case scenario is that they don't reply to your email and you move on to the next person on your list. So what type of research can you actually do? For this section of the video, I'm going to talk through something called the hierarchy of evidence, which refers to the weighting of evidence given to the design of a quantitative study. Essentially, studies at the top of the hierarchy are the gold standard and provide the best evidence for the research topic, whilst those at the bottom contribute to the pool of evidence, but often suffers from a lot of biases. So let's start from the bottom. Case reports are the least time-consuming type of research that you can do, but they don't often get published as a result of the fact that they are very low quality evidence. This usually involves identifying a clinical case to talk about, either because there is a rare outcome or rare disease, or more commonly because there is a lesson to be learned, such as a misdiagnosis or mistreatment. If you come across such a case, you can ask the consultant who is taking care of the patient about writing it up as a case report. You can use something like the BMJ case reports guideline as a general means of how to write up a case report, but the guidelines will differ slightly from journal to journal, so make sure you check these. You will also usually need the patient's consent in order to publish it, so you need to think about a way out of how you're going to obtain this. Something to note is that case reports are great when you're a medical student and they will count for a point in your foundation training. However, beyond core training, a lot of specialty training applications often don't recognize case reports as a original research publication and will not score you the same amount of points. So I would recommend that you don't invest a ton of time writing these and rather invest your time in a full research project which is more future-proof. Cohort studies are up in the next rung of ladder in the hierarchy of evidence. Retrospective studies are probably the most achievable for medical students since you're collecting data that already exists. Whilst cohort studies are comparatively a lot more time consuming compared to a case study, and also requires to have a basic understanding of statistics to complete data analysis, it is actually very achievable for a medical student and a small team. Clinical departments are often interested to see the trends in their patient population, and you're unlikely to require ethical approval, which can take some time to get. Randomized trials, or RCTs, are the second best type of research evidence that you can do. However, it's probably not something that you want to consider as a medical student. RCTs can provide robust evidence and potentially change practice because of the way that they're designed, it eliminates a lot of bias and you can identify a causal relationship. But there's a price to be paid. RCTs require extensive planning. They then need to be funded because they tend to be very expensive. You will need to get ethical approval, which can take some time. And you also have to jump through various hoops, such as identifying trial managers and recruiters. And in general, it just takes a long time to complete because you have to wait for patients who fit your eligibility criteria to come through the hospital doors. So you might have graduated before it's even completed. I would say that if you have any opportunity to participate in a small capacity in an RCT, such as acting as a recruiter or collecting a small amount of data, I would say go for it. But in general, if you're aiming to get a first author publication before you graduate, this is probably not the best use of your time. And finally, systematic reviews. Systematic reviews and meta-analysis are probably a medical student's favourite pastime by now when it comes to research. They're at the top of the hierarchy of evidence, and you also don't have to collect actual patient-level clinical data since you'll be using data that other people have already collected for you in other randomised trials. I personally think that systematic reviews have a pretty good time and effort to publication ratio, so if you're just getting started into research, this is probably a good place to start. Aside from thinking about projects in your local trust, collaborative research groups is also something to consider. National and international research collaboratives have been gaining traction over the last 10 years. 
By utilizing a number of trainees across a region or a country, they can produce large, robust datasets that are otherwise very hard to achieve with any individual group, and as a result, can produce clinically meaningful data that is usually well favored by journals. These collaborators will usually have a hierarchy with a steering committee, regional leads, and data collectors, where everyone will get some kind of contribution on the author list on the resulting publication. This collaborative working model means that each contributor will not need to do a huge amount of work on their own, but they will receive good recognition for their work towards a significant clinical result. It's worth noting, however, that collaborative research projects usually tend to score less than a project that you lead on your own. As of 2020, collaborative authorships do not count for a point on the UK Foundation Programme application. However, you might find that they count for applications first further down the line in your career, for example in surgery posts. There is also increasing pressure at the moment for the UK FPO to recognise collaborative authorship on the Foundation Programme application, so I think if you have the opportunity to get involved, it's rather short-sighted to say no. Some example collaborative research groups to consider are Star Search, Global Search and Incision UK, and many more. Most specialty training groups now have their own research collaboratives, so make sure you look that up. So now that you have a good idea of how to identify a supervisor and the type of research that you want to do, let's discuss research output. It is a good idea before you get involved in a research project to establish what you're going to get out of it. This is mutually beneficial for you, your supervisor and any other authors on your paper because it demonstrates your commitment and ensures that you get recognition out of your hard work. Remember to clarify your authorship status with your research team and co-authors to safeguard against doing more or less than what you are expected to do. In terms of research output, there's usually two things that we talk about presentations and publications. You should always consider presenting your work before publishing it as there's a number of conferences, especially large national ones, which will not accept any work that has already been published. As a general rule, you should aim to present your work once in each geographical level, so one local, one regional, one national and one international. Always try and aim for an oral presentation over a poster presentation since they usually count for more points even if they're harder or more intimidating. Once your abstract has been accepted, ask your supervisor and practice your presentation multiple times. You should also aim to present this to your department to get used to speaking in front of a crowd and come up with some ideas of questions that the audience might ask you so you have prepared answers. I find that doctors are usually quite nice to you when they know that you're a medical student and they don't expect you to have a breadth of knowledge, but also remember that if you do receive a question that you don't know the answer to, you can always defer that to your boss to answer for you. In terms of publications, your supervisor should really be the one to advise you on where to submit your paper. When selecting a journal, you'll hear people discussing something called an impact factor, which basically refers to how often the journal's articles are read or cited. The higher the impact factor, the more prestigious the journal. However, you'll be relieved to hear that this is something more for a talking point in an interview, and on paper, a low impact factor journal publication will score just the same as a high impact factor publication. Something else to keep in mind is that the process of publishing can actually take quite a long time, so don't assume that because you've finished the manuscript that the work will get published in a certain time frame. In the event that your paper gets rejected, try not to feel too frustrated. Look at the comments, make some changes, and you can always submit it to another journal with a lower impact factor. Lastly, I want to talk a bit about a career in academic medicine for those of you who, like me, found that you actually quite enjoy research. In the normal clinical pathway after medical school, you go into your foundation years 1 and 2, followed by core surgical and medical training, and then specialty training all the way until ST8, and then you become a consultant. The academic pathway, on the other hand, you can choose to go into the Academic Foundation Programme or AFP, which runs alongside a normal F1 and F2 year, but you get some dedicated time to do a research project. After this, you can either go back to the normal clinical pathway, or you can then become an Academic Clinical Fellow, which comes with 25% research time, and you'll start thinking about securing funding for a PhD or MD research project. You then become an academic clinical lecturer with 50% research time, and then finally a clinician scientist and a professor in the end after CCT. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope this has been helpful for those of you who were maybe a bit unsure about how to get involved in research and cleared up some misconceptions about publishing and presenting your work. Please leave your questions in the comments section below, and I'll try and reply or address them in a future video. Don't forget to subscribe as well for future videos on CV building for medical students.